it was the 1st of June 2011. Jackie Waller was finally about to have the life she wanted. At 39 years old, she worked as a successful manager for an insurance company and had three gorgeous triplets and lived in Missouri in the United States. But there was one chapter in her life that she wanted closed. And it was about to happen. Her husband and the father of her triplets, Clay, had agreed to divorce Jackie and it was about to become official. She could finally be free and move on with her life. But Clay wasn't going to let her go that easily. He came up with a despicable plan to ensure if he couldn't have Jackie, no one would. Welcome or welcome back to True Stories. Join the family and let us explore some of the most interesting true crime cases. As always, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. Clay Waller was a red flag from the very beginning. However, Jackie's love for him flattened those out and his speech impediment created a natural soft spot. From the very beginning, their relationship required Jackie to adopt the caretaker role. The problem was that Clay never grew out of it. When Jackie was pregnant with triplets, she was thrilled. Finally, she'd get to share the responsibility of parenthood with the love of her life. However, the truth would turn out to be quite the opposite. Clay flitted from one job to the next and took no share in raising their kids. Despite high-minded claims of affection, he didn't even play with them. On the other hand, Jackie not only worked hard at the 40 hours per week job, but single-handedly was the father and mother to her triplets. Rather than appreciating Jackie, Clay made it his mission to insult her every day. He made sure that Jackie felt small and invisible, the multiple affairs were one way to achieve that. He made sure to make her life hell. Jackie knew she had to get out of the marriage. Even though afraid of Clay's reaction, she knew enough was enough. She and her children deserved better. After Jackie broke down the news to Clay somewhere in 2010, it took her a year to act on it. That was partially due to Clay's hyper-aggressive response. The determined Jackie had told him that she'd be taking the children with her, and Clay started regularly threatening her. The threat scared Jackie so much that she kept a record of them in a diary at work. After all, she had to keep it out of Clay's reach. For example, he threatened to take the kids fishing and drown them he would revel in seeing her pained expression when he'd break the news to her. Another threat he'd frequently give was, a divorce will be your death sentence. By June 2011, Jackie had moved into her sister Cheryl Rosson's apartment with the five-year-old triplets. Things finally seemed to be working. Clay and Jackie had even started dating other people, surely, things had settled down. Having enough reason to believe she'd be safe enough, Jackie went to finalize the divorce and pick up her son from Clay's house on June 1, 2011. But, unfortunately, that was the last time her family would see her alive. That day, the 1st of June, Jackie and Clay attended the attorney's office to sign some papers for the divorce. Jackie called her sister, Cheryl Brennicky, after she left her attorney's office. She told Cheryl she was just about to go into Clay's house to collect their son Maddox. Jackie told Cheryl she would be home after that. But Jackie never made it home. At around 7 p.m. that evening Cheryl was frantic. She had tried to call Jackie, but received no answer. She tried Clay too, and he called her back. He told her he would let her know if he saw Jackie. Clay's house was an hour's drive away, and Cheryl got into her car and drove straight to Jackson, where Clay lived. She stopped off at the police station and told officers, I know Clay Waller killed my sister. It was a stunning and bold statement given Jackie had just called her a few hours earlier. So, what was it about Clay that made Cheryl sure he killed her sister before Jackie had even been reported as missing? Cheryl was aware of Clay's abusive nature since Jackie had confided in her several times. When Cheryl went into the police station in Jackson that night, officers took her at her word. They immediately sent an officer to Clay's house. Clay told the officer that he was with Jackie that day. They met at around 11 a.m. at Walgreens, went for some lunch, and went off for a while to do their own things around town, and met again at the attorney's office at 3 p.m. to sign some papers. He said she went back to his house as she wanted to discuss the divorce. They argued but it wasn't anything too big, but she just walked off. He looked for her, but when he returned to the house, her car was gone, so she had obviously left. Police found Jackie's car. Initially it looked like the tire blew as she was driving, so they looked into whether she may have taken a lift with someone, called for help, or if someone had abducted her. However further inspection of the tire revealed she didn't drive over anything. It had been punctured while the car was not moving. Police looked at Clay's account of the day Jackie went missing. They could see from CCTV footage that he did meet Jackie in Walgreens around 11 a.m. 
and they also saw footage of Jackie at 2 p.m., but that was the last time there was any sighting of her on the footage. They did find footage of Clay from that evening. He was at a toy store wearing different clothes than he had on earlier that day. Further footage showed Clay washing his boat. The problem police had was that they didn't know what happened to Jackie or where she was. But it was Clay's own actions that caused his own downfall in the end. He went around town taunting police and Jackie family. He told them they wouldn't find anything, he would press his horn driving by their houses and give police finger gestures. He was vindictive and arrogant and couldn't help himself. He always had something to say. But it was that need to have the last word and make further threats that truly got him. When the court gave custody of the triplets to Cheryl four months after Jackie went missing, Clay threatened her online. He wrote, you are dead. And with those three words, he sealed his fate. Clay was arrested on foot of the federal charge of threatening Cheryl's life. Clay pleaded guilty to the federal charge and got five years in prison. That allowed police to make sure a dangerous man was off the streets and not a danger to the community and gave them the time they needed to build a case against him in relation to Jackie's disappearance. Time was needed because without a body, police and prosecutors needed to build a very tight case based on circumstantial evidence. It took two years. Clay was charged with the first-degree murder of Jackie and tampering with evidence. The case against Clay was strong but as with all circumstantial cases, they are difficult to prove and there are no guarantees. When police searched Clay's house, they found the carpet missing in the hallway and blood on the walls in the hallway. They found the carpet hidden in the basement. It had been cut into strips, but there were blood stains on it, and the blood was a match to Jackie's blood. Clay was offered a plea deal. This plea deal was offered with permission from Jackie's parents. The most important thing for them was to be able to bring Jackie home. The deal was that Clay could please guilty to second-degree murder and serve a maximum of 20 years in prison if he told police what he did that night and where Jackie was. He took them to Devil's Island. When they reached Devil's Island, Clay could not remember exactly where he buried Jackie. He knew her body was in the area, but did not know where. However, one officer found the spot. Clay had told them he used fertilizer and that particular officer knew that it would kill the roots of a tree, so they found the dead tree and as a result, found Jackie's body. It was the 29th of May 2013. Almost two years after Jackie went missing. Now that they had found Jackie's body, police wanted to know what happened to her. Clay told police that Jackie wanted to come over to get intimate one last time before the divorce was final. When they were in the kitchen, they accidentally knocked heads causing Jackie's nose to bleed and she moved forward into the hallway which is why there was blood there. He then said that Jackie began threatening him saying he would never see the children again and she would tell people he had beaten her up and that caused him to lose it. He punched her once on the nose and then pressed his forearm against her neck until she stopped moving. He claimed the decision to kill Jackie was a spur-of-the-moment decision, he had not pre-planned it and was only due to her threatening him with the possibility he would not see the children again. His account was clearly inaccurate. Jackie had called over to collect her son Maddox. She did not know that Maddox was not in the house. He was with Clay's girlfriend. Clay also said he punched her once, but this was inconsistent with the autopsy results. The autopsy revealed Jackie had multiple fractures to her face and skull that were consistent with blunt force trauma. Clay thought he was clever painting a picture of how Jackie had almost forced him to kill her, but his lies didn't match up with the evidence. He didn't care, though his 20 years was the maximum he could get due to the plea deal. But there was one piece of information in particular that he revealed during his confession that he would live to regret. He told police that the day before, he dug a hole for Jackie's body. This was in contrast with his claim of events that he decided to kill her as a spur-of-the-moment decision. That meant he could be charged under the Interstate Domestic Violence Act which carries a sentence of 35 years and that sentence only begins after the 20 years is finished. In court, Maddox's victim impact statement was read out. The triplets were just five years old when their father murdered their mother. Even at such a young age they knew the impact of what their dad had done and that their pain was a result of his actions. Maddox wanted to make sure his dad knew exactly how they felt, we don't like you anymore. He said. The police were exceptional in this case. Quite often we hear of many missing person cases where police are slow to act or do not take it seriously. Thanks to Cheryl's brave statement that day in Jackson, police went straight into action and worked hard gathering evidence. They went above and beyond too to ensure that Clay spent the most time possible in prison. They know that someone is menacing 
and threatening as Clay will be the same at the end of his prison sentence and they need to protect the community. We've come to the end, thank you for watching, as always, don't forget to give the video a thumbs